and please be seated. Well, amen, very good. If you'll take God's word and turn with me to the book of Acts in the 21st chapter. In the book of Acts and chapter 21, and we continue on in this particular portion of scripture. In the 21st chapter of the book of Acts, we've been working our way through this chapter, and God willing, we'll finish uh, this chapter here this evening. Uh, we see the Apostle Paul now, his ministry as a free man for all intents and purposes has come to conclusion here. As we enter into this chapter, we're going to find out he becomes a prisoner. And as he becomes a prisoner, we're going to see, really over the next three chapters, uh, we're going to see that he is going to give, really throughout the remainder of the book, six defenses, six uh, if you want to use the theological term, the term would be an apology. Now, that doesn't mean he's getting up and saying he's sorry for anything. Uh, but he's given a defense, and we'll talk about that more in just a moment, of what he believes in. And we find that he gives one here uh, to the mob uh, that is going to ensue, the riot. He's going to give one before the council. Uh, he's going to give a third one and a fourth one before governors. Felix and Festus, he's going to give a defense. And the fifth one he's going to do before Agrippa, uh, the king. And then the last he does before uh, the Jews. He gives a defense of what he believes. We find out there are different cities that are involved. Three chapters, this chapter and the next three, we're going to find out have to do with what goes on in the city of Jerusalem, where he's at right now. And then we find out as well that he gives a defense in Caesarea, and then he gives a defense in Rome as well. Uh, and we find that out as we progress throughout this book of Acts. And what is, what is his defense? What is his apology? What is his, uh, what is his statement? Well, it is about the Lord Jesus Christ. It's just another opportunity for him to present the truth, to give the truth of the gospel. And he's been proclaiming that faithfully for years now, and so... Each one of these opportunities, uh, God opens up a door, even though bound, God opens up a door uh, for him to speak the truth about the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, to give out the gospel, and that's what he does. And the first of those defenses are found right here uh, in our passage here this evening in Acts chapter 21, where we find, of course, the Apostle Paul is now in the city of Jerusalem. You remember he's come on last time. Uh, we dealt with the fact that he came, he, uh, he arrived there in that city from uh, Caesarea. He's come, he meets with the, the believers that are there. They rejoice, of course, over the offering that he's brought. They rejoice over the souls that have been saved and all the different travels. He gives a report of what God has done through him. And uh, then you remember there was, wherever there's people, there's problems. And there was a problem that arose because there were thousands that had come uh, uh, to Christ, but they were still latched on to Judaism, and uh, uh, they had been uh, taught, they had been schooled, they had been instructed that Paul was against Moses, and you remember James and the other elders come to him, and they, uh, they ask him, uh, matter of fact, really, in, in all intents and purposes, they, they direct him, they give him a directive and a, a, a command uh, to enter in uh, with those four Jewish men who were uh, in that purification of their Nazarite vow, that seven-day purification, and to enter in with them into the temple to do that, and not just to enter in with them, uh, but so as it would be known that he wasn't against Moses and he wasn't against uh, uh, the Jews to pay for the sacrifices as well. And he's been asked to do that now. And he does. And it brings us to what happens. The, the passage that we're going to see tonight is the aftermath. Uh, uh, of what has happened now after this has taken place. And we find that Paul is in a bad spot, we might say. He's in a bad situation. And we find out that in this bad situation, he's going to give a bold testimony for Jesus Christ despite the negative circumstances. And we've probably found ourselves in bad situations before, and we have opportunity oftentimes in those bad situations. And we may be scorned at a workplace or... We may have opportunity for personal witness, and we know that we might be scorned and uh, we might be offended in that personal witness, or maybe there's some personal tragedy that's going on in our life, and we have an opportunity in the tragedy, we have an opportunity in the problem to testify for Jesus Christ 
In order to know how to do that most effectively, I think we ought to look at people who've had that opportunity and have excelled in that opportunity, who have been faithful and have been obedient in those opportunities that they had amidst difficult, dire circumstances to still be bold in their testimony for Jesus Christ. We think about giving testimonies, we think about uh, a setting like we're in tonight, a, a church setting where other believers are gathered together, and we think about testifying uh, before one another and, and, and in, in every Baptist church I've been a part of anyway, you know, we get up and we talk about when we got saved and, and, and we rejoice in that. And by the way, I'm not against that. I'm for that. That's encouraging. It's encouraging. I always say, though, when you give a testimony, it, it's great to tell about the fact that you're thankful that you're saved. We ought to be grateful that we're saved. But what has Christ done for you since you've been saved? That might have taken place years and years and years ago. Has Jesus done anything for you in that time period? Has he worked in your life in any way in that time period? Thank God, I got saved as a five-year-old little boy. That's hard to believe that that was 30 years ago. Hard to believe that's the case. But that's how long ago it was. But listen, thank God. Hey, he's done a lot in 30 years. He's worked in my life a lot in 30 years, and I, I praise God for it and what he's done and uh, how, he, how he burdened me after I got saved about obeying in believer's baptism. I wanted to follow him in baptism. I was scared to death of water, scared to death of it. You know, I get frightened looking at the bathtub sometimes, but uh, the fact of the matter is, you know, that's what God wanted me to do. And so uh, I said, okay, and uh, I did it, scared and all. And I'm here. God saw me through it. I didn't drown, praise God. And uh, I made it through. And then uh, God burdened my heart about uh, uh, living for him and surrendering my life to him to do whatever uh, uh, he wanted to do with my life. And I did that. That's not just, by the way, that's not just a one-time thing. That's a continual surrender to the Lord. That's a continual surrender to him. Then God called me to preach. and So many other things in between, little things you may think that are minute, but God dealt with my heart about certain thank God for it. I'm glad that he's worked in my life since then. Most Christians give testimony in church, but think about this. Think about this. The minimum amount of testimony, the minimum amount often goes on before a God-hating, God-denying world. That seems a little turned around, doesn't it? Where, where should our testimony shine the brightest? We should shine the brightest out in the darkness. We should really give a bold testament for Jesus Christ out there. It's easy to give one in here. What about giving one out there? Hey, the Apostle Paul, he was an example. He gave one before people that hated him. They hated, they hated the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what we need to use? We need to use the tool that God has given us. What is that tool? It's the tool of influence. That's the tool that God has given us. It's not coercion. It's the tool of influence on the lost and dying world. Paul knew how to... He knew how to do this, and we need to hear from him how to effectively, how to effectively be bold in our witness and our testimony for Jesus Christ. I want you to notice some things before we get into the meat of uh, the meat of the message tonight. Look over in Ephesians chapter three. Paul did something. He had the right view of problems. Paul had the right view of negative situations, of bad bad times. He had the right view of it. How did he view it? Well, look over in Ephesians chapter three and verse number one. Paul never viewed his situation as anything but God-authored. Look in Ephesians chapter 3, verse number 1. The Bible says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Rome. Is that what he says? I, Paul, the prisoner of the Jews. Is that what he says? No, he says, I, Paul, the prisoner of what? Jesus Christ. Hey, I want you to know something. I'm not a prisoner of these people that have put me in bonds and in chains. I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Hey, God, he saw fit to put me where I'm at. Boy, may God help each of us, this preacher included, that when we get in a bad situation, we get in negative circumstances, when we get in trouble and tragedy, may we say, you know what? God is bringing this to pass in my life. We, we like to... We like to blame circumstances. We like to blame other people. We like to do all those types of things. But he says, no, this is not an imprisonment of men. This is an imprisonment of God. 
He was always a prisoner of Jesus Christ. It was Christ who brought him into those predicaments. This is not the only place he makes reference to that. You can look in uh, chapter 1 of Philippians and uh, uh, in verse number 13 and chapter 4 and verse 22 and what he told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 9 that he was a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now here he is in Jerusalem. He's, he's accomplished all these things that we've talked about there. And now look in our passage here in Acts chapter 21 verse number 27. The Bible says, and when the seven days were almost ended, those seven days of purification, somewhere along the line, those four guys who were taking that Nazarite vow, somewhere along the line, they did not fulfill as they should fulfill it, so they had to go to the temple for this uh, purification, seven days of purification. And that's where James and the other elders told Paul, he said, why don't you enter in with them to do that and pay for them to do that. And so that's what he does. Now he's coming out, seven days finished, coming out, verse number 27. The Jews which were of Asia. Now, where, where was that? Those Jews that were in Ephesus. You remember there? You remember not only uh, uh, Ephesus, but Laodicea, Philadelphia, Thyatira, Sardis, all those cities that we find in uh, Revelation 2 and 3 in, in Asia. Not talking about China. We're not talking about India. We're not talking about Singapore. We're talking about Asia Minor, what would be today, present day Turkey. That's what he's talking about right there. He said those were to Asia when they saw him in the temple, those Jews. No doubt they recognized him. Remember, he was in Ephesus for three years. Trophimus, who he has with him here, he was from Ephesus. What did they do? They stirred up all the people and laid hands on him. Whatever impact, listen now, whatever impact that his entering into the temple with these four men had on the Jewish believers, we don't know, the Bible doesn't say, but I can tell you one thing, it had absolutely no effect at all on those Jewish unbelievers. None whatsoever. And uh, we find them as we are introduced to this mob in verse number 27. And uh, they're like any mob. They have no head. They have no head whatsoever. They're wild. Running crazy. Don't have the faintest idea of what's going on or why they're doing it. By the way, that's typical of a mob. That's typical of a mob. And so this narrative runs all the way from verse 27 all the way into chapter 22, verse number 30. Now, we're not going to go through all that tonight. We're just going to finish chapter 27. In this first defense, we're going to see several things. I'll give you three of them tonight. First of all, we see, number one, the advance of the mob. We see the advance of the mob. And they're going to advance on Paul here. The Bible says in verse 27, they laid hands on him. These men that Paul had been in this vow with, joined by Paul, they needed to finish up this seven-day purification. They're coming out now. The sacrifices are all done. And these Jews of Asia, uh, uh, they recognize Paul. They see him. He had been three years in the city uh, of Ephesus. Dramatic effects. Remember, he was attached to the synagogue for a short time, and then he, he went over and he taught in the school of Tyrannus uh, day and night. You remember that? Uh, and then, uh, uh, you know, he, he, he just created a massive impact on that city for the cause of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us in verse number uh, 29, they had seen before with him in the city Trophimus in Ephesian. And so Trophimus is there. He's an Ephesian from the city of Ephesus. And they were uptight about Paul being there. In verse number 28, crying out. Notice what they did. Crying out, men of Israel, help! This is the man that teacheth all men everywhere against the people and the law in this place and further brought Greeks also into the temple and hath polluted this holy place for they had seen before him in this, with him in the city Trophimus and Ephesian whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple and all the city was moved and the people ran together and they took Paul and drew him out of the temple and forthwith the doors were shut. And so a, a great stir is called. They saw these Jews. They saw an opportunity. They tried to do this before in Gentile areas but it never worked because it was predominantly a Gentile crowd. But now they're in their hotbed. They're right there where there's a great collection of them, a great group of them. And so they get stirred up. They saw this as an opportunity to get Paul. They saw him in the temple. And they stirred up the people, the Bible says. And that word stirred up in verse number 27, that, that word has an interesting meaning, the word stirred up. It means confused. What did they do? They confused the mob. The mob was absolutely confused. They had no idea what they were doing and why they were doing it. And let me tell you, at feast time, at the Feast of Pentecost, there was a mob there. It's been estimated there were some 2 million people there in the city. I mean, people really moved in and out of Jerusalem during the, the Feast of, of Pentecost. And, 
initially the Feast of Pentecost in the Old Testament, what was it? it? It was a time to celebrate the first fruits of the wheat harvest. That's what it was for, to thank God for the first fruits. Now, after the exile, after they returned from captivity and came back, it, it became a different kind of celebration altogether. It was said that the law of Moses was given 50 days after the exodus. That means that the Feast of Pentecost became associated really with the celebration or the birthday, if you will, of the law. And so here it is, and they're in there, and this whole feast is going on, what? As a celebration of the law of Moses, of the Old Testament law. That's what it was. And right there in the midst of that celebration, uh, a celebrating being a Jew and Jewishness to the very hilt, here comes Paul, who they said, was apostate, was anti-Jew, was anti-Moses, was against the law. And, and can you imagine as he enters into this thing? I mean, it's just walking out of the frying pan into the fire as he walked into that place. Now, two things I see in particular about this, though, that testify something about Paul. First of all, number one, the fact that Paul wanted to be there doesn't mean that he was anti-law. It means that he revered the law to a certain extent. Look with me in Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, if you will. Romans chapter 7 and verse number 22. The Bible says, For I delight in the law of God at the inward man. He wasn't anti-Jewish. He wasn't anti-law. In this sense, he delighted in the law of God. He delighted in it. And I see a second thing. The crowd was hyped up it was hyper-concerned about the law and about its sanctity. Now, anybody who would come in and who would stand in blatant opposition to the law, don't you think that it was, there, was going to be, there was going to be something to pay as he entered into that place with all their celebrating and all of that? And boy, what an antagonism that must have created there. And this group really gets worked up, and they're going to come after Paul to try to kill Paul. And so what do they say? Well, notice what the Bible says that they say. Verse number 28. Remember, they got them all worked up. Confusion, mob, no head. Crying out, men of Israel, these Jews from Asia, men of Israel, help! As if there had been some blasphemy committed. This is the man that teacheth all men everywhere against the people and the law in this place. Boy, that's, that's quite an accusation against the people, against the law, and against this place. Threefold accu accusation. First, they said, look, he's anti-Jew. Now, I don't know about you, but it's kind of hard for a Jew to say that he's anti-Jew. It's kind of hard for one to say of his own race, I'm against that race. <laughs> he is one of them. You know why? Uh, the Jews have a hard time separating. They, they have a hard time. They, they're, they're, they really struggle when someone comes to Jesus Christ as Savior. They really struggle with that. Why? Because they associate their, relate, their religion with their race and their nationality and their culture, one and the same. That's why when you hear about Jewish people oftentimes and they come to know Jesus Christ but the family is strictly Orthodox Jew, you find out that there's a, there's a shunning there. But you know something? If they understood, if they realized, if they knew the word of God, the fact of the matter is that one who would reject the Lord Jesus Christ as Messiah was really rejecting his own Judaism. Because everything about Judaism was what? Pointing to Christ. It was all pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ as Messiah. So if you want to know the real rebel against Judaism, the real rebel is the unbelieving Jew who will not accept Jesus Christ as his Messiah. He's the real rebel, not the Christian Jew. Now, one thing uh, uh, that we find out about this mob, they're fairly consistent. They're fairly consistent all, line, all along the line. They always followed the same pattern. Hold your place here in Acts 21 and go back just a few chapters to Acts chapter 6. Look back in Acts chapter 6. Mobs tend to follow the same pattern. Jewish mobs in Jerusalem. This kind of an accusation that Paul was against the people, that he was against the law, that he was against that place. I mean, that really stirred up all these people at this time. All those millions of people that were there in the city. Acts chapter 6. We find out that this mob is fairly consistent, though, because look in verse 
Number eight, the Bible says, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and Cyrenians, and Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. They were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Look, they, they couldn't beat him. They, they couldn't get one over on him. And verse 11, so if they couldn't, look, if they couldn't talk him out of it, if they couldn't try to uh, 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 argue out of it, then what did they turn to? Well, look at verse 11. Then they suffered men which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses, against God. Wait a minute, that sounds like the same argument they're bringing up against Paul, doesn't it? Seems like, like the, the exact same thing. And what did they do? They stirred up the people, confused. The elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council. And what did they do? They set up what kind of witnesses? False witnesses, which, man, which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against what? The holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered. And all that sent the council looking steadfastly on him saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. You know something else? We could look back in the Gospels and we find out they accused the Lord Jesus of basically the same thing. Basically the same thing, violating the law. And so up to this point, all the accusations are general, but now they become specific. They become specific. Verse number 28, if you look there again in Acts chapter 21, they've called all these people together. They give this accusation. He teacheth all men everywhere against the people and the law. And this place, by the way, all that was what? Lies. It was all lies. And further, brought Greeks also into the temple and hath polluted this holy place. Now, they didn't see Greeks in the temple, but they just supposed that was so because they saw him earlier with who? Trophimus, the Ephesian. I find it very hard to believe that Paul just spent seven days trying to show the Jews in that place that he wasn't against Moses and he wasn't anti-Jew to take what he had done and all the uh, 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 finances that he had put and invested in that situation. I find it hard to believe that he'd done all that for a week and now in just a moment he's going to throw all that out the door and bring Trophimus into the temple. I find that very hard to believe. He's not going to do, uh, undo in one act what he spent a week trying to build. I just don't believe that's the case. By the way, if he had Trophimus in there, it wouldn't be Paul's life, it'd be Trophimus' life uh, that would have been accounted for. You see, the Gentile could only go to the outer court. Matter of fact, it was called the court of the Gentiles there at the temple. There was a barricade there uh, as you went from that place if you're going to enter in to the inner court. And it was written, there were signs placed along uh, ever, uh, ever so many... Uh, 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 feet. Uh, there were signs placed along. They were put in both Latin and they were put in Greek uh, on that barricade. And uh, they find, we've, we found out what has been written on there. It said this, no man of alien race is to enter within the barricade that goes around the temple. If anyone is taken in the act, let him know that he has himself to blame for the penalty of death that follows. No man of alien race, who's he talking about? He's talking about anybody that's not a Jew. By the way, the Romans allowed the Jews to uphold that law. They allowed them to keep that law and execute anyone, any Gentile that entered into that place, any intrusion that entered in, any part. That was a, that was a, a, a security system for them that there wasn't going to be anything from the outside uh, uh, world that would intrude uh, into them, anything from the world, and that would not be violated. And I just can't imagine the Apostle Paul building all, trying to build all this trust in the Jews and then taking Trophimus in there and hazarding Trophimus' life, his good friend's life, not Paul's life, but Trophimus' life to do that. Just can't imagine that could be the case. Remember a mob? What are they doing? They don't know. They don't know what they're doing. They're confused. They're, they're something without a head. Remember, it was a time of feast. So the, the whole of the city was outdoors. They were milling around. The Bible says, verse 30, all the city, the city of Jerusalem, all the city was moved, and the people ran together, and they took Paul and drew him out of the temple, and forthwith the doors were 
shut. They wanted to make sure they got him out of here so their worship of God can continue on. They didn't care about the fact that he was a servant of God. They just wanted to get him out of there so they can continue on with what they were doing. Sound a lot like what happened at the trial of the Lord Jesus Christ, doesn't it? A lot like that. They wanted to make sure they didn't violate the Sabbath while they executed their own Messiah. You see, this is the confusion of religion. The confusion of religion. When you have form without reality, you have chaos. When you have form without reality, you have absolute chaos. And by the way, that's what most people's religion is. Absolute chaos. But God says, you know what? I have more in store for Paul. I'm going to extend his ministry more. So they're not going to kill Paul right here, but they, they grab a hold of him. So we see, uh, secondly, the arrest of Paul by the Romans. We see, first of all, the advance of the mob on Paul. But secondly, we see the arrest by the Romans. Look in verse number 31. As they went about to kill him, that was their intent. These Jews, they, they grabbed him and they were going to kill him. And so they start wailing away on him. Verse number 31, as they went about to kill him, tidings came into the chief captain of the band that all Jerusalem was in it up for. Now set right up against the temple on the north side of it was what was called the Fortress of Antonio. Had a great tower, and that tower could look down over the whole temple court, could see everything that was going on throughout the whole temple court. There in that one place where that uh, uh, tower was in that fortress, there was set up a thousand Roman soldiers. A thousand of them were there. What were they? They were riot squads. That's what they were. They were stationed there. Uh, that, not just there, but uh, the entire area there of Judea was known, of course, for much unrest. Remember, Israel hated the Romans. A lot of unrest went on there. And so they had a thousand people right there by the temple court. Now, the one great thing, if you study a little history, you find out about the Roman government, they didn't put, they did not put up with disorder. They were an orderly people. There was going to be civil order. They didn't put up with anything else. And anybody that allowed disorder to go on, any commander, he was in real trouble. And so the commander's sitting there, and no doubt he can see down from that watchtower, he can see all this commotion that's going on, the whole city in uproar, things carrying on. And uh, what did they do? Well, look at verse number 31. As they went about to kill him, Tinies came into the chief captain of the band. He's standing there, no doubt, up in the tower, and all Jerusalem was in an uproar, who immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down into them. And when they saw the chief captain and the soldiers, they left beating of Paul. So there they are, man. They're just wailing away on him. I mean, we're going to kill you, buddy. We're tired of listening to you. And they just start wailing away on him. But as soon as those Roman soldiers descend, they quit. They back off. They get away. The Bible speaks about that there. In verse number 32, they clear out. What happens? Well, in verse number 33, the Bible says, Then the chief captain came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains, and demanded who he was and what he had done. Interesting. Just a little bit before this, the same chapter, we find out a prophet by the name of Agabus comes to Paul before he ever gets. He comes there in Caesarea. Remember what he tells him? Remember, he binds his own hands and feet. And he says, Paul, if you go to Jerusalem, this is what's going to happen. And it happened, didn't it? It happened. He's bound here in verse number 33. Now, the, uh, the commander, the chief captain, he, he obviously believes that Paul is guilty of something. And so in his mind, no doubt, he's thinking, I'll arrest him and I'll find out what the problem is later. Uh, I'm just going to take him, uh, uh, take him captive. He's got to be guilty of something for them to be so stirred up about uh, uh, what they're stirred up about. And, and, and in matter of fact, later as we read this chapter, we find out he thinks he's just some rebel rouser, that he's stirring up the people. And so in verse number 34, the Bible says, And some cried one thing, some another. Typical of a mob. He couldn't get a, he, he couldn't understand. The chief captain had no way of knowing what the accusation really was. He couldn't get the information from the crowd. One person yelling one thing, another person yelling another thing. And so for Paul's protection, what happens? Well, the Bible says here, uh, uh, when he could not know the certainty of the tumult, 
he commanded him to be carried into the castle. And he, when he came upon the stairs, so it was that he was born of the soldiers for the violence of the people. So they put him up on their soldiers. Uh, their, the soldiers put him up on their shoulders so he doesn't get pulled and torn apart by the people. Uh, this mob that is out to get him. And so they're, they're burying and they bring him back to this fortress. They bring him back to this uh, tower. And what happens as they're bringing him back? Notice verse 36. For the multitude of the people followed after crying, Away with him! I can think about 25 years before this. Something similar took place in the city of Jerusalem. Didn't it? And Pilate brought out two people. He brought out Jesus Christ and he brought out Barabbas. And you remember what they said? Give us Barabbas. What shall I do with this Jesus of Nazareth? And what do they cry out? Crucify him. Crucify him. Kill him. Kill him. Away with him. They're saying the same thing about the Apostle Paul. Remember, whenever you and I, whenever you and I experience, whenever we experience negative circumstances, whenever we experience this world lashing out at us, and I don't want to hear about what you believe in, and I don't care about Jesus Christ, remember this. If Jesus himself were standing in front of them, they'd do the same thing. Paul said, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. What was meant for him, I've taken. I've taken for him. Paul, he's experiencing it right here. By the way, what do you hear Paul saying all this? Nothing. Remember we talked about it last week? His humility. He doesn't say that. He doesn't try to stop them. He doesn't say anything about it. No. He says, you know what? I just want to be an empty vessel that God can use. I'm just a tool in God's hands. You know, it's when we try to do things on our own that we make the biggest mess out of things. The Apostle Paul said, no, I'm just going to humbly look. I'm just going to humbly submit to what God is doing in my life. We need to humbly submit to God. We talked about it last week. We need to humbly submit to the leadership that God has placed in our lives. And we ought to humbly submit to even the suffering that God allows in our lives. I want you to think about this, though. Paul does say something here at the end of this chapter. The answer of Paul, as we look at the conclusion of this chapter, in verse number 37, as Paul was to be led into the castle, he said to the chief captain, now he's going to speak to this man who's in charge. He said, may I speak? unto thee. So now he's going to ask if he can speak. Paul is going to give first the first of his defenses. If you look at chapter 22, verse number 1, men, brethren, and fathers, hear ye my what? Defense. Hear my apology. Hear my reason for what I believe and why I believe it. I want you to hear me out. And by the way, Paul is going to give an exciting testimony as we look in chapter 22 later of the experience of what God has done in his life, how God has worked in his life. Now he desires and he wants to speak to this chief captain and the chief captain asked him a question. Verse number 37. Remember who the chief captain thought he was? Ah, this guy's just some rebel rouser. He didn't know anything. Just some ignorant, ignoramus. He don't know what's going on. So he looks at him. Well, can you speak in Greek? Can you, can you speak Greek? Why do you ask you that? Well, Greek was the language of the educated. It was the cultured language. It was the language of those who lived outside of Jerusalem and would have studied elsewhere. And the fact of the matter is the Apostle Paul says in verse number 8, 38, the questions continue from the chief captain. Art thou not, art not thou that Egyptian which before these days made us an uproar and led us out of the wilderness, 4,000 men that were murderers? He said, look, aren't you that guy that that troublemaker, that rebel rouser, that Egyptian, that, uh, that assassin? Isn't that who you are? You say, what are you talking about? Well, the fact of the matter is that there was an Egyptian who came into Jerusalem. He led a group of about 4,000 people, and they were just going to wreak havoc in Jerusalem. And the whole point of what they were going to do, historical fact, the whole point of what they were going to do was kill Jews. And they killed about two to 400 of them, routed them all. He was just trying to kill as many Jews as possible. He was anti-Jewish. And he captured, killed, probably somewhere around 600 uh, uh, of these assassins were captured. The rest of them escaped. They kind of went underground. But he, 
uh, uh, he would continue. They never actually caught the gang leader of it all. And he would continue to come in. And so they thought, well, this is, this is just that guy that tries to stir up things and kill Jews, and he's here at the feast time because there's more Jews than any other time, and he's just here trying to, to kill other Jews. You know, aren't you that Egyptian? Isn't that who you are? That's what the chief captain says to the apostle Paul. That's what he thought. Verse number 39. But Paul said, I'm a man which am a Jew of Tarsus, a city of Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city, and I beseech thee, suffer me, allow me to speak unto the people. What's he telling him? He says, I want you to know something. I'm not that Egyptian. As a matter of fact, I'm a Jew and I'm from Tarsus. Now, that didn't mean a whole lot maybe to you and I, but in that day and time, Tarsus was ranked right up there with Alexandria and Athens. It was a high, it wasn't, when he says it was no mean city, that means it was, wasn't just some off-scouring place. It was a well-thought-of, well-looked-upon city. He said it was of Cilicia. That was the area in which, the region in which uh, Tarsus was at. And so Paul says, look, I'm, uh, uh, I'm not just some hayseed. I'm not just some rebel rouser. No, I'm, I'm a Jew. I'm from the city of Tarsus in the region of Cilicia. That's where I'm from. Not any mean city. And when he said that, of course, I'm sure that chief captain said, well, you know, you're not as backwoods as I thought you were. And his next statement is very interesting. His very next statement in verse number 39, look again. He says, I beseech thee. I beg of thee. I, I implore, please, in other words, suffer me to speak unto the people. Now, I tell you tonight that that took exactly what we talked a little bit about this morning. That took boldness. If it had been me, I'd have probably been like, look, I'm not that guy. This is where I'm from. Get me out of here. Let me go home. Let me get out of this place. They're not, they want to kill me. But not Paul. What does Paul say? He says, will you please let me speak to them? Well, I, I, I want to speak to them, please. You see, I think Paul, it seems as though as we study the Bible, he had only one way of dealing with things. <laughs> Confrontation. He was going to confront them. You know, there's something about that kind of boldness that's exciting. Paul stands up and says, look, I, I want to speak to the people. Let me, let me give my defense. And I think that that chief captain, he had to say, you know, the only way I'm going to get to the bottom of this is to let this guy talk. Because every time I ask this mob, I, I can't get a straight answer. I got one person saying one thing, another person saying another thing, another person saying another thing. Remember, mob, no head, confusion, chaos. He says, I, I got to let this guy speak. And so in verse number 40, when he had given him license, permission, if you will, Paul stood on the stairs, beckoned with the hand into the people. What's he saying? Quiet, listen. Quiet down. And when there was made a great silence, now what does he do? He speaks in the Hebrew tongue. Now, that's not actual Hebrew like you and I think of. That was Aramaic, the tongue of the day. That's what he spoke in. He speaks in that to the people there. So he could speak in Greek. He could speak in Aramaic. I'm sure by this time the chief captain says, okay, this guy really is not some rebel rouser. He can speak in either language. Now, you may say, okay, preacher, that's nice. That's a nice story. But what in the world, what in the world do those 14 verses have to do with me? March 17th, 2013. Well, what do they have to do with me? I tell you, Paul gave such a bold, testimony in a negative situation there's a couple things we see from it first of all first of all I want you to notice this he accepted his situation listen this is important look if you don't get anything else get this I'm wrapping it up he accepted his situation as from God you remember when he said and whatsoever state I'm in therewith to be what content he accepted this now look his freedom has come to an end. He says, I accept this from God. What's going on in my life, I accept from God. Hey, you remember what he said back in chapter 20 uh, there uh, uh, when he was in Miletus talking to those Ephesian elders? He, he had already said, look, bonds and afflictions. The Holy Spirit testified 
Verse number 23 of Acts chapter 20. Bonds and afflictions abide me. Verse number 24. But none of these things, but what things? Bonds and afflictions. None of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear to myself, so that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. You know what most people do in a bad situation? Most people do this. God, why have you forsaken me? God, uh, where are you? Why do you let this, uh, uh, this happen to me? Why do you let the devil do this to me? Not Paul. Paul says, no. No, I accept this is from the Lord. This is what God let me do. And I accept this is from God. What else? How else did he make such a positive thing out of such a negative thing? He used every situation as an opportunity to glorify God. He used every situation, good or bad, he used it as an opportunity to glorify God. I'm telling you, folks, we can learn a lot. We can learn a lot about troubles and trials and struggles and why bad things happen to good people if we'll just look at Paul's testimony. He said, listen, I accept this is from God. This is what God desired. God sold down through the ages, and he knew this was going to come to pass. I accept it from him. I'm going to use it as an opportunity for his glory. 1 Peter chapter 2. Look with me. 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Verse number 19. 1 Peter 2.19, For this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience toward God endured grief, suffering how? Wrongfully. For what glory is it? If when you be buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently. But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently. This is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. What's he saying? What's Peter saying? Peter's saying, Christ suffered for me. Christ was the example. Christ was telling me, I'm going to suffer too. How did Christ set the example? Christ set the example in his attitude. Christ set the example in his attitude. What was, what was the example? Look at verse 22. Just those first few words. Who did no sin? Who did no sin? Let me ask you a question. Did he deserve to suffer? No. What's Peter saying? He's saying, I want you to know something. By the way, he's writing to a bunch of beleaguered, beleaguered Jewish Christians in First Peter. He's writing about suffering, and he's saying, I want you to know something. You are going to suffer when you don't deserve it. You're going to suffer when you don't deserve it. You're going to be in a bad situation. You haven't done anything to get into. Remember, he who did no sin. Go on in verse 22. Neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously look in Hebrews chapter 12 Hebrews chapter 12 verse number 3 the Bible says for consider him who's him Jesus that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself lest you be wearied and faint in your minds What's he saying? He's saying, look, you haven't died suffering yet. You haven't died suffering. Your, your, your bad situation isn't that bad yet. You haven't borne all the sins of the entire world on yourself. You haven't done that. When you think you're the only one in a negative situation, I want you to go back to 1 Peter for just a minute. When you think you're the only one in a negative situation and you didn't deserve it, remember something. You're not alone. Jesus was there. First Peter chapter 4. 
1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice! Inasmuch as you're partakers of Christ's suffering, you partake the same thing Jesus partook of, that when his glory should be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. Peter said, look, look, you expect suffering at the hands of an ungodly world. You expect negative circumstances because of the evil that's in the world. Remember that God allows these things. Remember that you're going to suffer. Accept it as an opportunity from God. Yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Now let me tell you, you know why we struggle, I think, so much with this? We struggle so much with this because our whole world wants to pamper everyone all the time. And that's why. And we struggle so much with it. We think it's undeserved. You know, if somebody slips in front of us at the grocery store, we think it's undeserved. Pity little trifle little things like that. First Peter chapter 4, verse number 19. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing. Don't forget this. As unto a faithful creator. He's a faithful creator. Let me ask you a question. What did Jesus do in the midst of a negative situation? Oh, praise God. He paid my sin bill. He paid my sin bill. Listen, dear friends, he took my hell and your hell. In a negative situation, he did it. He maximized, he triumphed in a negative situation. You know something? He did that in a way that he could not have done in any other situation. He did it for you and he did it for me. That's the example. And that's what Peter meant in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 24 when he said, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sin should live in a righteous by whose stripes ye were healed. Hey, think about Peter. Paul wasn't the only one that took a bad situation and turned it into the positive. Paul wasn't the only one that accepted that situation from God and that entered in and used as an opportunity to glorify God. Peter did the same thing. You remember way back in Acts chapter 4 when he was brought into the Sanhedrin. And you remember his testimony. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Right in the face of those religious leaders, he gave a bold, bold testimony. He maximized his opportunity for Jesus Christ. And by the way, what did they do? They beat him. Had enough. Well, first of all, though, they said this, look, we forbid you to preach in his name. We forbid it. And what did he say? Is it better to obey God rather than men? And he continued. Then they beat him. They beat him. And after that, they threw him out. Remember, they threw him out. And they, the Bible says they prayed, Lord, Give us more boldness. And what happened when that happened? The Holy Spirit came upon them. They were filled with boldness. They spoke the word. And what happened? Thousands of people came to know Christ. Thousands of people came to know Christ. And that got them so worked up. I mean, they were just, I mean, just worked up into a lather. This time they took him and they threw him in prison. And what happened? The believers prayed. <laughs> and God opened the prison and let him out. Angel went in and said, Get up, wake up, Peter. Time to go. Remember, they got to the door there and knocked on the door, and Rhoda came to the door. And she shut the door and left Peter standing outside. Went back in. Hey, Peter's there. Oh, be quiet. Go sit down. Teenagers, go sit down. You know. So they went back out there, and here he is, man. He's still this time, you know. Hello. They let him in. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying boldness. I'm talking about boldness. Paul said, I accept it as the will of God. Paul said, I'll use it for an opportunity to glorify God. You know what? God help us to view it that way. God help us to view it that way. May we be as fruitful as these believers were here. May we be as fruitful. May we take suffering. Look, we don't like it. We don't want it. We definitely don't want to ask God for it but it's coming. Trouble's coming. What will we do with it? We going to run away from it? Are we going to run away? 
are we going to say, no, Lord, this is from you. Give me the grace to use this as an opportunity to bring glory to you. Our heads are bowed right